This program is sponsored by Able Ideas, Greco Printing and Imaging, Comics Wellspring, Grand River Ballroom, and Shorty Bell's Pizza. Welcome to another episode of Comics, Beer, and Sci-Fi. Today, we are going to take a look at the really cool Comic-Con in Flint. I just live there, and I'm so glad to see the Geek Squad is growing. That's awesome. Well, up first, we're going to start with my favorite, the really cool cosplay. Let's check it out. Well, those were really cool. Another thing this show is known for is the great wrestlers. That's right, and we actually have an interview with Brutus the Barber Beefcake. We have the meat. <laughs> this is the Q from Comics Brand Sci-Fi. I'm here with the legendary Brutus the Barber Beefcake, and uh, I'm getting ready to get a haircut after the interview. <laughs> so, how's it going today? Hey, everything's great, man. The Flint, Michigan, haven't been here in a while. It's a great town, great people, fans here, it's tremendous. We're having a good time. Good, good. So I want to talk about your legendary wrestling career because you are, without a doubt, a, a legend. So do you have any, like, one of your favorite matches or favorite segments that you did? Oh, uh, yeah, uh, probably 10,000 matches, but uh, one, one I remember uh, with Greg. Washington State in Spokane, Washington, and Jimmy was managing him, dressed up what? like Peggy Sue. <laughs> and I remember I was laying under under the bottom rope, and Greg came running across the ring, charging across the ring, and he kicked me so hard he screamed. <laughs> <laughs> I had to cover my face <laughs> so that people would see me. It hurt like <laughs> but I was made, made me laugh. <laughs> you know, that was a stiff kick when, yeah, he, stiff when he yelled. Kick. And then uh, after the match, I pulled Jimmy's falsies out and stripped it <laughs> and pulled the pantyhose off. I was, <laughs> people went absolutely bonkers. They went out of their, <laughs> they went out of their minds. That was, that was some classic stuff. Is there anyone that you particularly like today, or are you still watching the product? Uh, A and E, uh, A E W. I watch some. Uh, I got three grandsons. Uh, they love Jungle Boy, and they they like uh, Chris Jericho. Oh yeah, Jericho. Chris, Chris is a good friend of mine. They okay. just they uh, just his band just uh, redid uh, my music. Yeah, yeah, they're, yeah. They're, they're, uh, updated like guitar version of the, you know the barbershop music. So it's nice. it's cool as and uh, nice. so. All is well, man. I'm just happy, to, glad to be alive and in Tennessee. That's what I was gonna say. <laughs> Great to be alive in Tennessee. <laughs> well, this has been the Q with WWE legend Brutus the Barber Beefcake, and it's been an absolute thrill. I have a treat for you. I'm here with legendary actress Lorraine Bracco. Tell me, Lorraine. Back when you started acting, did you ever think you'd be coming to conventions, meeting your fans? No, but it's really fun. You know, when we make movies and TV, we don't really meet a lot of the public. So when we come here, it's just very humbling and nice, and people like my work, and they think I look good for my age. I love that. <laughs> you look great for 39. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> so tell me, I know you get these questions all the time about Goodfellas, but 
What was it like working with Martin Scorsese for the first time when you first started acting with him? Scary. <laughs> oh, but intimidating. I had all the boys, so it was intimidating. And then Ray Liotta, did he help you a lot during in a lot of your scenes? Yes, thank God for Ray. Yes, Ray was very serious. He knew exactly the scene and, and how he wanted to play it and, and kind of pushed me in my marks. He was great. He was a great leading man. Now, when the movie came out, were you concerned that it wouldn't, like, th that the, the viewing public wouldn't take to it very well? Because there was, like, kind of negative test screenings to it. Ray, right. was it a very successful movie? I mean, I think it made I don't know if it even broke $50 million. It was a very low uh, turnout. And over the years, it became a, a, a cult classic, right? These are the best movies out there. The ones that simmer until, and they become a souffle. It simmered. <laughs> and let's think about all the directors you've, spoke, you've worked with. You've worked with Ridley Scott also. Oh, so what was his tech? A nice list. I have a great director list, Dick Donner. He did Superman, Radio Flyer, Goonies, um, all the lethal weapons. No, no, I've been very lucky. Of course, Ridley Scott, amazing. So tell me, when you got casted in The Sopranos, was your role in Goodfellas a big part of how you got casted in it? Well, I think David Chase wanted to meet me because of it, because of my work in Goodfellas, so. Yes. James Gandolfini, what was it like to work with him? He was a pain in my ass. I don't know about anybody else. We had a great relationship, don't get me wrong. It was a lot of fun. Um, we played a lot of jokes on each other. He was a great actor. Finally, what do you got coming down the pipeline? What do you got coming out? Um, I have a movie coming out with Vince Vaughn called Nornes, and I have a movie coming out with um, Mark Wahlberg. So what's up new this week on the gaming segment, Samantha? Actually, we're mixing it up this week, and we talked to the guys behind Masters of Myth Card Game. Hey, it's the Bradcast, and I am at the really cool Comic-Con, and I am here with Zach of Masters of Myth. Tell me all about it, Zach. Yeah, so this is our own proprietary card game. We all come from card playing backgrounds, so we wanted to make our own. Uh, we built it over the past three years. We all met in college up in Midland over at Northwood. So this is our own card game. Currently we have two out right now. We're working on our third one that's gonna come out next year. So from the ground up, it, every idea and artwork is unique to our game. So we have four unique artists that each have their own art style that we pre-incorporate into the game. Games are super quick and easy. All our rules currently fit on one piece of paper. We had. We had them on one page. We Technically, it's one sheet of paper. We changed the wording. Now it's quick play. Anybody can learn it. It takes about 10 minutes to learn, 20 minutes to play. So how did you make the transition, Zach, from playing other cards to making your own card? So yeah, I come from, uh, especially myself and my partners, we all come from Magic and Yu-Gi-Oh! Pokemon playing backgrounds. I mean, we've all been playing Magic for about 10 years now. Um, I played Yu-Gi-Oh! for a long time. So we all wanted to make our own card game but no one said anything and eventually just was like, hey, what about we make our own card game? Cause we just, we kept spending more and more money. We kept spending more stuff. We wanted to, we wanted to do our own thing. So eventually we decided let's just sit down and make it. So it took us about three years or so to make it. And then uh, a lot of play testing, a lot of play testing, a lot of artwork, a lot of going through revision, revision, revision. And then eventually we ended up with what we have now. For all of my good friends and viewers who are not here and unable to buy these in person from you, Zach, how do they buy them? So if you go to our website, it's gonna be your close, as in you are close, gaming.com. We have our own website and a web store. You can find us on Facebook as well at your close gaming or look up Masters of Myth on Google. Call me, we'll play some cards. We'll get them from Zach. We'll see you next time. Now it's time for our first commercial break. Don't go anywhere, there's more comic experience sci-fi. If you're looking for a fun place, with great food, lots of arcade games, and a huge beer selection, then look no further than the Grand River Ballroom. It's in the basement of Shorty Bells and the Detroit Beer Exchange. Oh yeah, this is where all the superheroes and villains come to hang out. Hi, heroines. Can I play next? Back in the way. Pick up for Richie. 
All right. Wow. These smell good. Guess she was hungry to me. Hey, ladies, you got room for one more? No. Get out of here. Scat. <laughs> oh, thank you. No problem. Hey, buddy. Got your usual. Thanks. Put it on this tab. Here's your piece of pal. And a cold beer. Aww. Now that's what I'm talking about. So come on down to the Grand River Ballroom where excitement awaits. Welcome back to Comic Spear and Sci Fi, everybody. You know, one of the great things about the really cool Comic Con is they have some excellent cosplay guests. They do, including one of our favorite charity groups, the League of Enchantment. And we had a chance to talk to one of their members, Rhino Cosplay. Put in the cause and cosplay. This is Richie Rollins with Comic Spear and Sci-Fi at the really cool Comic-Con in Flint, Michigan. I'm standing with Ryan from the League of Enchantment. How are you doing today, sir? Good, how are you? Pretty good. I like your little Spider-Man outfit there. Uh, could you tell the folks at home what the League of Enchantment is all about? Uh, well, League of Enchantment is a 5013C. Um, nonprofit. We're a, a nonprofit charity group in Michigan, primarily that we visit at hospitals and we take gifts to kids and care packages, and we do that along with visiting other non, you know, like nonprofit events around the state, like 5Ks for like cancer walks. We work with Make a Wish. We are very active. We like to come to conventions like this to basically spread the word of what we do and try to raise donations um, just to help us uh, get the gifts for the care packages. How long has League of Enchantment been around? Really, they started in 2017, and we've just kind of got slowly grown since then. I think now we have about, what, 90 members statewide, and we go to events all over the state. All the way, we've gone all the way up to Houghton Lake, all the way down to, you know, Detroit, all the way over into Kalamazoo area and uh, South Haven. How could somebody contact you? If you want to join or even want to donate, just go to our um, website, leaveenchantment.org, or you can even email us at leaveenchantment uh, at gmail.com. Oh, and you personally, are you always Spider-Man? I am not always Spider-Man. I'm mostly known as being Superman, actually, for the group, because I do Superman quite often. I'm also, you can find me online. It's Rhino Cosplay. Um, I'm on most of the social medias, too, if you want to see some of my stuff. But I do Superman, Spider-Man, I've also done Snake Eyes, and Shazam, and <laughs> a bunch of other characters also. Does anybody do villains in this group? Um, yeah, we've got a few villains. We've got a good Joker, um, it's done by another Ryan in our group, and we've got um, a few others. They just don't break them out usually for hospital. So we usually do them, because we even have a good Maleficent, we've got a few other like kind of villain characters. But the, the hospital visits are mostly like heroes, and um, princesses and stuff like that, so that way we can bring some like you know smiles to the kids and like just kind of break up the, the monotony of just the hospital. What's up next, Nick? Well, what's up next was a real treat for me. I got to interview Howard Shaken, legendary comic book artist, whose biggest claim to fame is probably that he was the first comic book artist to draw Star Wars uh, for Marvel's adaptation of the original Star Wars film. Hmm, let's check it out. I'm here with legendary comic book artist Howard Chaikin, and thank you for talking to us, sir. Thanks, Nick. I'm glad to talk to you. We're so glad to see you here. Um, I read a lot of your work during the 70s when I was growing up. When I was a child, too. How did you uh, become involved with Marvel? I don't remember. I honestly don't. I really don't recall. Yeah. Uh, Marvel had no interest in us. I mean, you have to remember that when, when, when I came into the business, Marvel was all about Stan and a bunch of guys our father's age. And uh, when, when, when Roy moved in, Roy was the one who started bringing, bringing younger guys in. So I have no recollection whatsoever of why I, how I ended up in Marvel. I've never, I mean, I, I freelanced for them, and I've never been on the inside loop with Marvel the way I was, say, at DC. I was because I had, I was rabbied at DC by Joe Orlando. And so I got a lot of the inside workings there, which I never did at Marvel. I was always a, I was a side guy. And so Marvel was never a big part of my experience. You know? Okay, well, whether you like it or not, it was a big part of our experience, you being at Marvel, because you drew the original Star Wars I did. adaptation. I did. How did that come about? Um, George Lucas asked me to draw it. I think he expected better work than I delivered. Um, I Had I known it was going to be as big a deal, had I known it was going to be the source 
of what has become a secular religion. Had you seen any footage or did you have to go by production drawings? I broke the script down into six issues. The first time Roy saw anything of text was when he saw my artwork delivered. He wrote from my breakdown. Um, I had the Macquarie paintings and I had 40, 40, 400 stills, which all looked like, like Ikea in space. Okay. You know, that, that was it. I had no idea what Jabba the Hutt looked like. You know, there was no indication of the script that he looked like, uh, like you know, like, like Mr. Happy. You know, uh, nothing. In the original footage, he was a guy, you know, just a regular human character. They made him a slug in you're, you're, the third you're one. You're for someone who cares. Yeah. <laughs> ah, what fun. You know, Jill, I still have my original print of the Star Wars Treasury Edition. And uh, in those days, there were no streaming or Blu-ray. You wanted to experience the movie at home, you had to read the comic book. Yeah, oh, by candlelight too? That's funny. Yeah, you're probably as rich as those, those books, huh? Yeah, I'm quite a collector's item. Ah, oh, I need a drink. Let's check out the beer segment. Hey, it's the Bradcast, and I am here with Thomas Cleary, and we are at Sedona Tap House. Tell me about Sedona Tap House. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so, so lots of beer, great thing, <laughs> um, and we have lots of fun with it. Uh, so Sedona Tap House actually started as a concept in uh, Midlothian, Virginia. Uh, Dennis Barbero is the founder of the company. Uh, veteran restaurateur uh, noticed that there was a, kind of a dearth of uh, craft beer restaurants and saw this void and decided he wanted to fill it uh, as a lover of uh, craft beer and, and all, on all fine things, you know, all, all gastronomy. And uh, so actually started doing a, a craft beer focused restaurant with a tapas and small plates. Um, opened up with 50 beers on draft and over 500 in the bottle. So uh, qu quite a selection, yeah, in uh, 20, um, 2011. So at a time where it wasn't as popular. So of your 50 beers on tap, it is a beautiful line of, of, of tap heads. Tell me what they, uh, what is it comprised of? We generally have eight to 10 uh, beers at each location that we would call mainstays um, and try to cover uh, the gamut of styles, um, you know, looking at a range in terms of uh, alcohol content, in terms of stylistically from lighter to uh, to heavier as far as flavor profiles, uh, making sure that we hit everything there. And then with 42 beers or 40 beers, uh, we play and have lots of fun and, uh, and, and are constantly changing uh, the rotation so that every time uh, someone comes, there's something new to try. You know, a personal pet peeve of mine is where I go and uh, to a, a draft list and I can see what whoever bought the beer likes and that's it. You know, we want something for everyone. Uh, that's the wonderful thing about beers is there is a beer for everyone. You know, the, the style range is, is so incredible. You know, when you go from like a light lager to a uh, heavy stout to an IPA to a wild ale, you know, something with spontaneous fermentation like a lambic, um, that can be so much fun. And so, so to really have the gamut. And so, so we look at, you know, wanting to make sure that we have, you know, a great local selection, uh, that we also have uh, some great international choices to come in uh, from all over the country. There's, there's some great beers. Uh, and then again, having balance and style so that if you want to come in and uh, you really like, you know, an old style British mild, you can have that. If you want a, uh, a new style New England IPA, you can get that. If you, if you want a stout, whatever it is that you're looking for today, we've got it for you. And, and that's the idea, uh, to be able to pair with, with your meal. How long has this uh, Novi location been here? Yeah, uh, so we came here in 2019 um, and, uh, and have been here since, and, uh, and, and it's been, been excellent for us. We've loved this community. Uh, we, we've uh, been very blessed with, uh, with a great following of people coming out and uh, loving craft beer and loving great foods. Thank you to Sedona Tap House and Novi for having us. All that beer is making me thirsty. I think I need a break. We'll be back with more Comics, Mirror, and Sci-Fi. Ideas comic book production company where we bring your ideas to life. Come check out our Birmingham office and see how we do here at Able Ideas. Okay guys, you're almost there, but we need to make it look more real. It needs to pop off the page and grab it. Let's make it happen. Let's go drop in on the art team. Our team. Our clients want more realism. <laughs> No! Wait! Well, guys, hope you enjoyed checking us out. Make sure you follow us on social media. Able Ideas with the Z on Instagram, YouTube, and check out our website, ableideas.com. Make sure you order your comic books, and I gotta get out of here. Bye, guys! Go! 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 Welcome back to Comics, Beer, and Sci-Fi. Hi, Taiwan. How are you doing today? Hello, Jill. I feel great. 
I had to step in for Nick at the last second because he's somewhere stumbling around. What's next, Jill? Oh, well, uh, <laughs> at the really cool Comic-Con, they are also known for their anime voice actors, and we were fortunate enough to catch up with one. Let's check it out. Hey, it's the Bradcast, and I'm at the really cool Comic-Con with Bryson Bogus. Bryson, how are you? I'm doing great. You do some really fun stuff. Uh, Saint Seiya, Attack on Titan. How did you get started? So I actually have a background in theater, and the way that I was able to get my foot in the door for uh, voiceover specifically was going to a theater audition where one of the directors of a local studio who actually works on this stuff saw me there, and he recognized me as a fan of this stuff, because when I was early teens, I'd go to conventions as fans and stuff like that. Once he saw that audition, I guess he realized, oh, this kid can like actually act, and he knew that voiceover was something I was interested in, and so he called me in to do some extra voices, and I guess I kept doing good enough for them to keep calling me back and sort of spiraled from there, essentially. So how long have you been doing it? Uh, about eight years now. I just passed up eight years in July, so it's it's been a while for me now, and it's, it's a dream come true, honestly. I've been wanting to do this since I was 14. I'm 28 now, so literally half my life I've been wanting to do this. So. Well, the dream come true thing is, is something that we, we really enjoy. Um, is there anything new that we you can tell us that's coming down the pike? Um, currently, there's a mobile game called Honkai Star Rail that came out. I play the character Jepard in that. Blue Lock is another show that just came out this past season, but it uh, supposedly has new seasons and a movie coming up. It's, it's something I'm definitely looking forward to, and hopefully they get the cast back for those. But those are two some really big ones that people might not know me from uh, that I think they should definitely check out. Well, I appreciate you taking the time to talk to us. Thanks for coming here and uh, letting the, the fans come and talk to you. We, we, we appreciate it the same way they do. This has been the broadcast with Bryce and Bogus at the really cool Comic-Con. Thanks, broadcast. So what's it? You know, I, I just had a vision. A vision of the future. Uh, of what? An interview with Kevin Pike, the special effects supervisor for Back to the Future. Well, let's check it out. This is Richie Rollins with Comic Spear and Sci-Fi. I'm standing here with Kevin Pike. Uh, how are you doing today, sir? I'm well. Thanks for coming to the show. And Mr. Pike here has worked on several films. What are some of the films you've worked on? I started out on Jaws when I was a kid, and I worked for about six months on location with them, helping get through that, and I came out to Hollywood and chunked my way up, learning chops on TV shows and things like that, and I started supervising my own films. Obviously, one of the big feathers in the cap is Back to the Future. We did Close Encounters, we did uh, Revenge of the Jedi, Fight Club, Michael Jackson's Moonwalker. I worked on Jurassic, Jurassic 3. I did Ed Wood with Tim Burton. A lot of wonderful projects. You worked on the car in Back to the Future, correct? I supervised the special effects for Back to the Future, and our crew of about 20 guys, after about 10 weeks, made three DeLorean time machines for the movie. How'd you get involved in that show? I was working on another show previously with that, and the director of photography, Dean Cundy, who I'd worked with before, had a notice about this show starting, and he said, I think you'd be good. I'd like to put your name in and see if you want to do the show. And I went in for the interview, and they liked me, and I just made a condition that I wanted to make sure I built the car because I realized how big of an element it was for the project, and they went ahead and said, okay, Stephen wants to make sure nobody takes pictures of it while you're building it. And with that, we started. Did you, did you get to pick the car, or was it already picked before you went in as being a DeLorean? It had just started to become a car idea. When we got there, they wanted something that could move around so it wasn't locked down. And they had a pickup truck with a refrigerator with a plasma energy inside it. And that turned out to be, we want a car that's spacey looking for the scene where the car comes into the barn and looks like an alien spaceship. So they talked about the Delo uh, excuse me, Mercedes-Benz Gullwing 300, but that was a little too pricey for them. And at the time, you could get a, a, a hot deal on a DeLorean time machine. So they decided on the DeLorean, and next day, three of them came into my shop, boom, 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 and we started building. Did you ever get the DeLorean up to 88 miles per hour? It's pretty heavy. Yeah, except at the time, the speedometer didn't really go up that high. It only went up to like 85. You know, and so we had to take the dash apart, take that plate out, send it to graphics at the studio, have them redo it, put it back in. 
make sure that it could go past that so it could show 88. And obviously the iconic car is an everlasting image in everybody's mind. It's a pleasure to be a part of that history. You know, Taiwan, I had a vision too of the past. And we interviewed one of the stars from Back to the Future. Well, Joe, wouldn't that be the future? No, the past. But the show's airing now, I mean, that... that... It'll be in the past and the future. Ah, oh, time travel movies make my head hurt. Let's just get past this. What do you remember about being on the set for Back to the Future? Well, Back to the Future was Bob Zemeckis and Bob Gale, who I done uh, I Want to Hold Your Hand with. And that was their first film, and then we did Used Cars. Oh. And, uh, and then the third movie was Back to the Future, so Wendy Jo Sperber and I were in, you know, we didn't have to read. We just uh, got the parts because, you know, they always kind of kept us together. Uh, and when you read the script, you really weren't quite sure what was happening. But I do remember uh, in Back to the Future when we went to the screening and we saw the movie. <clears throat> and afterwards, it was like, wow, this standing ovation. I mean, really, was it was like, what did we just see? Because you really couldn't get it from the script. But then when you saw it on screen, it was just like, we just went on the greatest roller coaster ride ever. You worked during that Eric Stoltz phase, right? Do you yes, remember sir. the mood on the set when those changes were announced? Oh, yeah. Well, the mood, when, when he was doing his thing, uh, you know, he wanted to be called Marty. And it was a bit, uh, you know, on the set, it was a bit, uh, you're kind of walking around a little gingerly because you knew you had, there was an actor there that kind of, you. You know, it's that method actor. You know, the story is that he kind of was forced onto, into the character by Universal, who was kind of high on him, but he just wasn't right for the part. I don't know, it just didn't, I, I, it wasn't working. The comedy wasn't working. And I don't know how, maybe a month into it, they put a little reel together and showed Universal and just said, well, what do you think? And they kind of agreed, like, you know, he wasn't right. And then Mike was there, and Mike was working uh, his TV show during the day, and then we would film our stuff at night. All of our stuff was done at night. You know, my what my involvement, and in, he just would sleep in the car, or he worked his butt off for that thing. Really yeah. did. Did you notice a noticeable improvement when Mike came out of the set? Did you go, okay, this is working? Uh, yeah, there was. It was definitely on the lighter side where it should have been. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, you definitely, the tone was completely different. To be in, in that franchise, uh, to be in the Superman franchise, I've been, I've been a, a lucky Screen Actors Guild member for, for all that stuff. All right, well, that's it for this week. For more really cool Comic-Con coverage, make sure to follow our YouTube channel. Yeah, and next week we're going from Flint to Monroe to check out the Monroe Pop Fest. And is that in the future? Yes, Taiwan, that's in the future. We'll see you guys next week.